You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. I don't know that I really think about things. And, you know, I never thought about me not writing a book as a failure. I just thought like, oh, I've gone in a different direction. It's only in hindsight that I've said hmm. I I failed at writing a book a lot of times. because I'm definitely a, like I spin every situation for the po- I am a disgustingly interminable optimist. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. I'm Heather Vickery. And I'm Alan Seals. And guess what? Heather and I started out as two perfect strangers who met by chance and embraced opportunity. So now you get to listen in as we chat with other successful people about the risks they've taken to put themselves on a path to creative success. I'm literally reading this. How many episodes have we done? We've done... This is episode 40, blah, blah, blah. And... I still have to read this? What's wrong yes. with us? Some, it, that's accurate. The times that we've tried to do it without the script in front of us, we always fuck it up. Okay, okay, here, we, here we go. Here we go blind. I'm going to blind. And I'm Alice Seals. Listen in as we have... Wait, hold on. <laughs> Listen this in is as a good we, start. Hold on. Heather and I start... Okay. Have, uh, and I was, uh, Alan, Heather and I started Alan, off as Alan, two perfect Alan, strangers who Alan, embraced the opportunity Alan, Alan, and embraced... Alan, opportunity. Alan, Alan, Alan. Alan, Alan. Can we introduce our guest? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm riffing. How's we your are day? not alone here. I know, but okay. Look, <laughs> listen. Okay, who is who keeps laughing? Who's that laugh? I know she's not sure what she's gotten herself into. You guys, I'm, I am mm. so excited to introduce you to Paula Lafferty. Have you ever met someone who's successfully creative without actually creating anything to be successful for? Well, you're about to. Because I'm going to introduce you to Paula. Sometimes the chances that you take in life look simply like showing up, like taking up space and doing your hard work out loud where anyone and everyone can just come along for the ride. Paula has been a writer at the center of her heart in her life forever. She's got tubs filled with journals, but she never really believed that she was good enough to write novels. And in the meantime, she garnered some extremely large social media following of people who are interested in what she's written, but they haven't read a word of her writing because it didn't exist until now. Paula is finally starting to write the book. Well, actually, she's not finally starting to write the book. She finally started to write the book, and now it's coming out, and we're going to talk about it, which is really exciting. The book of her heart, she calls it. She's going to tell us more, I promise. And she said that when she started writing that one, something magical happened because she just finally kept writing. And we thought it would be fun to talk about what happens when the whole damn thing is intentional risk. So, Paula, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Man, what a distinction. Haven't made anything yet. (laughs) Except you have now, right? So when you started your your journey, you hadn't. and, and And that's not true anymore. Yeah, that's a pretty, it's, it's like a, li- a full life shift for sure. Wait, so you said uh, there are tubs of journals, like li- literally tubs, like why? Yes, literal yes. tubs of yeah. storage Yeah, I should have brought it downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> why? Okay, I know journaling is important. Um, what are you journaling about in general, right? And then- stuff. Well, what a dumb I mean, question. well, that's not, actually, that's not a dumb question because if you're now, if you're now like, I'm going to turn it into a book. Sorry, it snorted. You have to. T- <laughs> no, no, that is. I am going to remix that snort. <laughs> Snorts have to stay in. For Snorts sure. are staying in. <laughs> Drop that bass. bass. Sorry, tell us about your journals. It's not a dumb question. Well, there are no, no dumb it is questions. no. It's not a dumb question because it's their journals. But I didn't really journal in any of them. Like actually, um, I would. I mean, these are some of them. They're like the little diaries that have the little lock on them that you get when you're seven years old <laughs> with a tiny key. Uh huh. Oh yes. And um, that turns out those you don't need those keys if you just like muscle it enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> but or TSA I, locks. They're just uh huh. I would um. I just started writing like snippets of stories in them. I've got, I don't know, probably over a hundred snippets of stories that I started or wrote a scene from 
I never wrote anything else. And I would just like leave them around my parents' house. And as I got older, my mom just started throwing them all in a box. And eventually, you know, I'm 30 something and married and she's like, come get your shit. <laughs> I'm not going to store <laughs> yes. this for you anymore. And so that's what all the the tub of journals is. It's all of the, I mean, it's the graveyard of uncompleted stories. But the crazy thing is, so the day she gave me the, um, the tub, I opened it and started going through them. This is how I cleaned. Like I, I slowly go through things and get distracted and get nothing done. But I stumbled on, I'm holding up a journal for those of you who can't see it. Um, <laughs> I stumbled on this one journal that happens to be the one that I wrote the first snippet of the idea for this book in 13 years ago. Wow. And it's, it's dated and I found it 13 years to the day of when I wrote down the idea for the story. It was like goosebumps everywhere. So it's wow. been a fun discovery to go through those. Okay, I love that. Mm. I love all of the, I don't know, quantum physics behind that, right? Like, I know. Mm, everything is intentional. <laughs> yeah. Well, then the stories, the story in your journal then, or what you were journaling, was it fiction, nonfiction, oh, sci-fi, romance? Oh my like, gosh. What, okay. what are you focused on? So most of the like pile of journals was... Uh, a lot of fan fiction, like embarrassing, embarrassing fan fiction, <laughs> Lord of the Rings and Indiana Jones and like all of So fantasy has kind of always been my jam. And when I, I finally actually wrote a book, it was fantasy. Um, but honestly, it's still kind of fan fiction because it's an Arthurian story, which all King Arthur stories are basically fan fiction. <laughs> so... <laughs> Can you take us through that journey? Like you opened this book or your yeah. journal that you had written 13 years ago. And and then were you like, this is the story. I'm going to keep writing this story. Or or had you already come back to it and then you discovered? The yeah, the, the wild thing was I had already come back to it. I was about, I want to say about halfway done with the book when I found it. And oh, wow. that... I mean, that made it even more. I like immediately got on my phone. I was like, I gotta make a TikTok video about that because that's the weird instinct that I have now when something happens. It's like, we gotta put this on TikTok. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'd started the book in, uh, let's see, the end of March of last year and kind of shared a chapter with my sister and I recorded it because I wanted to have control over the written word. And I was like, if I read it out loud, then I have full control and it'll sound the way I want it to sound, even though I don't trust my writing enough. So yeah, so I sent my sister the recording and she was like, you have to keep going. And I shared it with a friend. And then that friend, we have this little tight, new, tight knit group of us. That friend told the other friends about it and everybody was like, well, I want to hear it. So that was kind of like this weird motivating thing that I didn't anticipate. Every chapter, I recorded myself out loud reading it and shared it with this little group of friends. And partly it was really great for editing. And partly it was also like this built in encouragement squad who was constantly like, you have to keep writing. And when I got to the point, there was one chapter that I got to that I was, I, did the thing that we do um, when we're making something. We convince ourselves, this is stupid. What was I thinking? This wasn't the great idea. I believed it was. And I kind of stopped for a while. And I had this crew of people that was like, what are you doing? We need the next chapter. Like, you you got it. Come on, TikTok. We need the next chapter. Uh, so that s sort of was a, a really big point that brought me back to it when, you know, I was kind of ready to give up on it within myself. Why do you keep... Uh yeah, why'd you keep questioning that? Why, why, if you're going to start it, yeah. why start and stop and start and stop? No, I'm serious. Uh, like, uh, like, no, it's a great question. Yeah, like some some people are like, it's the starting that is the biggest hump, the biggest yeah. problem. And then once you start, you just have to finish. But then other people, like, yeah. So for you, why start so much and then not finish? I think it gets so. I mean. You start it and you've got a little bit of motivation there. Yeah, the starting is hard too. But once you you get a few things on page and it's so exciting, you've got this big story ahead of you and all of these characters and these things you're looking forward to. And this is something that I studied film in undergrad and it was all, we made a lot of sh shorts in college. Um, and so that was, you could, you could see it beginning to end. You could sit down and write a 10 page screenplay in one night. In fact, you had to, cause you know, there was like, you were going to get an F if you didn't turn it in in the morning. But 
with something else where there's no there's no stick hanging over you. There's not really a foreseeable carrot in front of you. I, I mean, the carrot is finishing the story, but it's just a novel is so big and so overwhelming. And there's so many pieces to it. And I'd always thought like, you know, studying film and studying screenwriting, why why do people write so many bad stories? Like, <laughs> what, what's their problem? Why are people writing so many boring things? But really, it's just, it's hard to tell a big story. And without an external motivator of people saying, you're good at this, you're worthy, you're valuable. I mean, it really is, for me at least, a journey of finding my own self-worth and realizing that whatever anyone else thought of it, my telling the story for myself had to be enough. I also think it is a very common story for women in particular, because we are consistently told we should question ourselves and don't take up too much space. And right. I mean, that's a very, yeah. very, it's, it's not exclusively for women and it's not all women, but it's very common. Absolutely. And that's why I started to say accountability is boss, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I'm a transformational success coach and that is what I think I, m I am most desired for as a coach is like, just help me follow through on these things that I'm telling you are important to me and somebody to listen and encourage you. So I love your little squat. I call that your personal board of directors. Yeah, <laughs> I, agree. I dig it. <laughs> I also, I've, I mean, I've realized like this is, I knew it was something that a lot of people struggled with. There's, there's some statistic and uh, I believe it is 3% of people who start writing a book actually finish writing a draft of the book. Really? And that's Absolutely. not even, that's not even publication. That's 3% of people who start writing a book finish it. That and doesn't surprise me. Yeah, I was talking to a friend about it and he was like, I would contend it's even less because how many people start a book and never tell anybody that they've started writing a yeah. book and Yeah. Well, and I've written a book. For those of yeah. you watching, you can see it over my shoulder, but it's nonfiction and I cannot imagine writing fiction. And I'm an avid reader. And I'm like, I do not know how anybody's brains can do this and how they keep track of it. <laughs> and like, hats off. But that's actually an interesting point. So, right, you you didn't believe in your ability to write a novel. Um, you struggled with it. So what brought you to social media where all of a sudden you have this? And, and I, I mean, I'm curious about the whole thing, mm -hmm. how you started, what got people in, like, what was that first viral moment? And... And did that shift help you write this book? Yeah. Um, so I found TikTok uh, during the deep days of the pandemic when it was like, I don't know what to do with myself. So I'm going to watch these short videos of people dancing and find some serotonin from the giggles on TikTok. Um, and then just from the nature of scrolly, 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 I stumbled on uh, the corner of book talk, uh, where people talk a lot about literature. And then within that, there was writer talk, all of these people who talked about writing together and people who were self publishing and people who were traditional publishing. And I, I don't know, something like seeped into my spirit a little bit during that time. And it, I guess, was it 21? I can't even keep track. I guess it was last, it was 2022 then. So it had been a while. It had been ruminating for a little bit before finally I had decided, um, I talked to a friend who he is, I think in his, in his early seventies and he had talked about, he's always wanted to write a book. He still wants to write the book. And I kind of had this conscious thing of like, I don't want to wait until I'm in my 70s and realize I never tried. Uh, so I started, I made a deal with myself that I was just going to write something every day. And uh, it did, sometimes it was just, I'm writing today because I promised myself I was going to write yeah. and that was mm -hmm. it. Um, and then I wrote out the beats to this Star Trek fan fiction that I had come up with a long time ago. And I actually really liked the story and I was like, man, it's such a bummer that this isn't a story that I could write and actually share with a bunch of people. Why don't I actually write a story that I can share with people? And so then I stumbled into the story and started sharing a little bit about writing on TikTok and didn't, I mean, I got a little traction. I made some friends and developed some community, um, but it wasn't actually until I finished the book and I had been recording 
as I finished each chapter, I would print it out and record myself flopping it down on the table. And then at the end, so I finished the book on January 1st, 2023 at like 1.29 a.m. or something I've like that. I've seen that TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I compiled that video and uh, put it to some music that I kind of had in my heart, come up, had in my brain for a while. And that video went bonkers like bonkers you never know you guys can see alan's face you never know, I know. what what the video <laughs> will be it. like you just I never mean, nothing, know nothing yeah. against your video i just don't understand the algorithm <laughs> no it's wild well and some of it there's like yeah that's a whole other conversation the algorithm but um it was i posted it at like 10 p.m one night and by the next day at noon it already had a million what? views um uh-huh wow. yeah so it took off like in the wee hours of the morning and I woke up and it had a hundred thousand views and then it was getting like um a thousand views a minute after that or something ridiculous. So um and now I think it's gotten twelve point two million views. I don't remember um, how to count that low. <laughs> you know what I think? Here's why I think because of what you said before, of the incredibly small percentage of people who show up and finish their writing i think mm -hmm. it spoke to the to the rest of the world who is like man gosh i wish i could do that or i would feel that kind of emotion if i could finish my book or all of that right like i think they mm -hmm. could see themselves in you I, yeah maybe yeah i don't i don't know i was kind of doing it to motivate myself too like i had to create a lot of carrots for myself along the way <laughs> like celebrate this celebrate that every little thing and so that every time getting to flop a chapter down was a mini celebration a mini victory so but yeah i think a lot of people i mean it's i got i, I think hundreds of comments about people who are saying someday this is my dream i want to do this it, it's that kind of before and after effect too People love seeing before and after videos of a Absolutely. fitness journey or whatever kind of journey it is and seeing that it's harder to see in writing. And I kind of stumbled into a way to show that, which was really fun. We're going to take a quick break. Stay tuned for more of the episode. And now we're back. What? How old were you when you started journaling, by the way? Oh, God, I don't even know. Like nine Really? <laughs> yeah. My nine year old loves writing stories, uh -huh. but they, they, my kids go to a school or have gone to a school that really prioritizes story writing from, they, they do a publishing party at the end of every year where they publish That's to so the school cool. community something that they've written and self illustrated. So oh. story writing is her favorite part of the day. I don't know if they'll keep doing it, but yeah. It's so cool. It's so, so cool. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a thing that like, I don't know, I feel like if you have a pull to tell a story, um, there are a lot of people who have that pull and who we ignore it for years and years. But man, being on the other side of it, there is just nothing like completing that journey. I try to do my work out loud also. Like if I'm thinking about it, somebody else is probably thinking about it. And so I share it. And if somebody sees something hopeful or possible for themselves, then they resonate with it. Is that is that part of what you're experiencing? Yes. Um, yes. And I just think that community is so at the heart of all of it. I showed up into that TikTok space and found community and felt like I had something to offer, something to add to it. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's just been, I don't know. It's just been a really special thing to get to meet people. I like the, I'm having I have real friends from the internet, which is I know freaking wild to be like, it, oh, I know you. It You're, is, and you I'm, really do feel like you know them. Like these, yeah. these people would would show up in a knife fight for you. <laughs> like <laughs> <it's> would, true. <laughs> <laughs> but what they are going to do is be your. They're they're your. Pro, I assume I don't know your beta readers, your followers. They're going to show up to your book signings. They're like, yeah, they're your people. Yeah, I was going to ask, like on TikTok, uh, Heather, something you said a, a little a little second ago was um, that uh, was it personal board of directors, right? You have people that keep you accountable. Is it TikTok? Is it that community that you felt obligated to continue to report to to uh, re you know your your figurative mental earnings that you have to give to your board of directors? <laughs> Is that how you? had continued like i guess where did you find that drive to actually yeah. get over the block that you kept running into 
lots of I'm, I feel like I made as many motivators for myself as I possibly could because I've failed so many times at this. I was like, okay, if I want this time to be different, I need to change everything. Uh, so there was the alpha readers, the people who were watching the videos were real life in person friends. Um, and then creating this community on TikTok and then finally sharing a little bit about the book. It's so vulnerable and frightening, but also really freeing to just be like, fuck it. I'm telling you everything. I'm laying it out there. I'm offering all of myself and it may, as your internet did, it may all just shit the bed. Uh, <laughs> but if you, it's that whole thing of like, <laughs> I don't ever want to I don't want to get to the end of my life and think about all of the things I didn't try because I was afraid I would fail or I was afraid somebody else wouldn't like it. That's just the, it's been the hugest reason why I don't do things. And that is the shittiest reason not to do something. Yeah, that's what regret's made of. So I don't know that TikTok, like, I don't know, in the middle of it, it, it for sure was a motivator, but I don't think that that was the biggest accountability point, but it was... Like, that's been a big accountability point in the aftermath. Like, now that there are people, like, kind of paying attention, I feel a really big obligation to make sure I finish this in the best way possible. What can we know? Oh, you gave us a tiny snippet of what the book yeah. is. But, hey, what's it What's it called? What's it about? You've you've signed publishing contracts. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. And, and where's the intentional risk in oh. in pursuing publishing? Because Jesus versus self-publishing. Because I self-published. And maybe that was fear. I was like, fuck it. I'm going to get this book out one way or another. Versus I have friends and former clients who are like, I'm not writing a book if it's not going to be published through the traditional route. So I'd love to hear about that. And the risk and the chances you took with that. 100%. I'm super excited to talk about that. So I'm making publishing announcements tomorrow from the day we're recording this. So, okay, let me start with what the book's about. So it's called La Vida Guinevere, um, which translates to The Life of Guinevere. Uh, it's about this girl named Vera who's growing up in present day, living her ordinary life when she finds out she is actually from the 7th century. And she is the legendary Queen Guinevere. And so she has to go back in time and she has to reclaim her place in um, Arthur's kingdom. And there's all of the classic cast of characters. And I feel like nobody fits in a box of who you would expect them to be from the original legend. So there's – I try to honor the original legends while also really offering something that is – uh, new and authentic and genuine to this story. Um, it's called La Vie de Guinevere because the first full rendition of the Arthurian story um, is La Morte d'Arthur. I'll hold up a copy for those of you who are watching. Um, <laughs> and it's it's the first time all of those legends were compiled in English. So it was never written in French, even though it's called La Morte d'Arthur. In fact, the conjugation is incorrect like it should be La <laughs> I love that you're a Frenchophile because I am too so I actually I'm, I'm not a Frenchophile but really? when I when I posted a video about it I was talking about Lamar D'Arthur and all of these French people came on my video and they were like that's incorrect I was like tell it to Thomas <laughs> Mallory he wrote this in like the 14th century I swear it's not me I I didn't do it <laughs> so um with because my book has time travel in it, um, Vera, Queen Guinevere, yes. um, growing up in present day, she, the this book exists within, Le Morte d'Arthur exists within her universe, um, within the universe of the book. She hasn't read it, but it exists. And so the this La Vie de Guinevere, so it's the death of Arthur, and then the life of Guinevere is the title of my book. And okay. um, so it's sort of like, it's not an answer. It's kind of a little... They sort of go together a little bit. Yeah. That's all I'll say about that. I don't want to I get love too that. Much away. Okay, so you're not going to say much more, but you have hit all of my excited points. It's I'm here for time travel. I'm here for history. When is it dropping? Yeah, so this is the announcement I get to make tomorrow. Um, I Woo-hoo. have been really dead set on traditional publishing for a very, very long time. And I had always said, like in videos and stuff, 
it's because I don't know the business side. I'm not an organized person. I can't handle all the I don't editing. Ah, um, Wait, what selling. Was that? Ah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you nailed it. Um, but the truth is, I wanted to traditionally publish because of the clout, because I yep. wanted somebody else to tell me that my book was good enough. Um, because as time went on and like all of these people signed up for my newsletter and followed me on Instagram and followed me on TikTok, like you I used to it. say, oh, it's about yeah. promotion. And then as I learned about finding editors and finding cover artists, really the only reason that was left uh, was clout. Um, so I had finished, I have this, I had this one agent that I've been following for a long time. And I called her in my head. I was like, that's my agent. But it required writing a synopsis of the book, mm -hmm. not just like a little blurb, but like a all of the things that happen in your book. And I was like, nah, I fucking can't do that. So <laughs> she was closing to queries for the for the rest of the year. And I was like, okay, it's now or never. Closing I've got to queries. finish. And he doesn't know what closing to queries means. I don't, yeah, yes. explain cro cro qu queries to closings. <laughs> So, okay, for, for traditional publishing, you need to get a literary agent. And so you have to pitch yourself, pitch your book to literary agents. And it's this whole long process. They get like hundreds of submissions a week. It's so oversaturated. And they have to pick who they're going to represent based on market marketability, based on length, based on what they've represented before. So there's all of these factors that go into it. Um, and this an agent, a literary agent, is only open to submissions, some of them, like, very brief periods of time. Um, and if you're not in that window, you can't submit to them. Usually, you have to secure an agent, and then the agent does the same thing that you've just done with your book, except they do it to editors and publishing companies. Um, so that is the process of trying to get your book traditionally published. Mm -hmm. So this agent was going to close to queries, and I was like, okay, i got to write this damn synopsis. And I, you know, stayed up to like 2.30 one night making sure it got done because I'm a last minute girly. She was closing to submissions at 7 a.m. So I was like, all right, we're doing it right now. And I got the synopsis done. And I felt so good about it. And I hit submit. And then I was sitting there that morning and I had come up with these ideas of things I wanted to do if I ended up self-publishing. And one of them was like, I want to do a special deluxe edition um, to be released at the same time as the regular edition of the book. I want to do a Kickstarter for that. And it would be this like faux leather cover and this gold embossing and like yes. gold leaf that's pages. So sexy. <laughs> Cause that's, that's what I want on my bookshelf. Yes. So I was like, yeah, wouldn't that be fun? What a fun thing I could do. And then I was like, oh man, there are all these publishing companies. And when they release books, like what Fourth Wing did, they released um, a first edition, special edition where it had the sprayed edges and if oh, you could find it at a certain bookstore so you could dreamy. find it or sometimes they'll do like barnes and noble exclusives like you have to buy it at barnes and noble in order to get the page overlays or the extra chapter and i was like oh man if i self-publish because tiktok and instagram are the place where i got any momentum on this i want to do a tiktok exclusive edition with the sprayed edges oh yeah, so I was really excited about all of these ideas. So I submitted to that final agent. And I was like, okay, well, I'll wait to hear for her from her and decide what I want to do. And then I realized I was disappointed at the idea of traditional publishing. Like, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, so I decided I'm going to self-publish. And I'm going to be releasing then about a year from right now. And I'm partnering with this Kickstarter company. They've done some amazing Kickstarters for deluxe editions. Like, I don't know if you know Travis Baldry, who wrote Legends and Lattes. His, it's a really successful, cozy fantasy book. But he did like a, a super successful Kickstarter with them. And they've never partnered with a debut author before to do a deluxe edition. But they're they're partnering with me. And so I'm really excited that... Um, we'll get to launch that Kickstarter and uh, to go along with all the other publishing things. So, okay, I exciting. love that. So, first of all, I, I want to be. Let me know. Let me know how I can be part of it. I want to be part of it because I'll give you posters. It's, it's so cool. But I love that you really wanted the clout of traditional publishing, and that's. I'm not throwing shade at anybody who does that. It's a oh, real no. thing, and you had the social media 
platform to get their attention. And that's like the hardest part is that, you know, they're like, if you don't have at least 30,000 followers, we don't even, we're not even going to remotely consider talking to you. But I think the chance here, the risk that was in really beautifully embraced was this desire to do it your way and to bring in this TikTok community that had become like a family for you. And you're like, yeah. you know what, fuck this, I can do this. I can do this and y'all can do this with me and that'll be part of the fun of it. All right, one more quick break. Hang on a second. All right, here's the rest of the episode. I'm so excited. Yeah, it's like there's no guarantee on any of it. And I felt a little bit, at first I felt really insecure about the decision because I was like, I have four agents who had asked to see full manuscripts when I finished this last round of edits. And I had a publishing company that had reached out and I never said anything to them because I decided I wasn't going to do that, which feels a little bit stupid, but I'm just really excited yeah. about doing it a yeah. different way. I think it's brave. I am fascinated, by the way, about the fact that there's like sprayed edges and gold this and embossed that. And there's like this whole little subculture of book artisans yeah. that I didn't know even existed mostly because of the fact that i am a i, I i'm a, a digital person because i want to save the yeah. paper nothing against those who want to kill hey, trees hey, and, hey, and hey. destroy the planet hey. Ah. hey 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 um, but uh, what, 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 what 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 did i say what did i say if you love books you love books. oh I, I know i know but i love the stories behind the books and you know me as a podcaster i love to listen to them i love to sit in bed in a dark room with great headphones and listen to an immersive well, we can assume story. paula you're going to do an audio book right because you yes of love course to read your stories yeah about. that's the plan well and that's the other thing i'm going back and forth on like should yes. i record it also probably somebody who's from england should um, do it because i can't read the i can't read the story without just putting on an <laughs> accent and i feel like that's gonna make a lot of the globe mad not that a lot of the globe would hear yeah. it but i just do you need a I don't really do, i don't want to do it dirty do you need a really bad cockney nope. accent because i can i can audition for you <laughs> Why wouldn't I need a really bad Cockney accent? Okay, but yes, Alan, with the specialty books. So anyone who's been listening to this podcast or following me anywhere knows that I am 100% obsessed with Red, White, and Royal Blue, the movie and the book. And I am actually not, I shouldn't, I'm not as, as into it as some people. I only have one copy of the book and I, I'm afraid to admit publicly that I gave away my original copy because when I got the second one, which was a hardback with the bonus chapter, I was like, oh, well, I don't need the first one anymore. However, for my birthday, I have asked for the special French edition for all the reasons Ooh. that you just talked about, right? It's got a- It's a better kisser. It's it's in French and I'm a Frenchophile. We talked about that. And um, mm -hmm. it's got a different title and a different cover and it's got Vanessa Kelly's artwork on it and it's got all the fancy edges and I'm like, cool. I need to have, like I sweat when I think about it. I'm so <laughs> excited. You know what? <laughs> oh my gosh. You know what? That's that's interesting. And I, and in all seriousness, I equate this to comic books uh, in, a, in a way because uh, uh, there's, depending on when you buy it or where you buy it, sometimes you can get different covers that are limited edition, special editions, Absolutely. bagged versions that are like, you know, certified, signed by the blah, 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 right? So I, I get it now. I get it. You just got to, you got you to gotta yeah. dumb it down for me. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, there's so many. I mean, I've got this this version of Lamort d'Arthur I have this like over a hundred years oh, old my wow. sister found it in a library in That's Edinburgh so I mean people cool books stick around oh, I think it's time. pronounced Edinburgh so <laughs> I, I know what you're saying <laughs> only if you Edinburgh. are a 12 year old child I, did, I don't we don't even gender that it's just <laughs> no, it's Edinburgh <laughs> See, I told you. Uh, bad so, Paula, you have a film degree, which actually my eldest child is has gone to the University of Washington for a cinema degree. Same thing. <laughs> that you say, right. That you say the University of Film degree. That's not. Yes, I, okay. yeah, I assume she's going to classes. She hasn't university. bothered to tell me anything about her classes yet. But I assume she's actually going to classes and all that kind of stuff. But um, I'm curious what led you to a film degree. And then you pivoted in a really mm -hmm. big way. Uh, into ministry, and I have questions about that too. So let's start with let's start with film. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. Uh, yeah. I I've always wanted to be a writer. If I'm just being totally honest, I always wanted to be a writer. And I this whole convincing myself I'm not 
I wasn't good enough to write a book. That was not a new thing. That was something that has stuck around. I would decide I I would get up the gumption and decide I was good enough and then give up. And like this was that was the cycle. Um, and for some reason, I felt like film screenwriting felt more manageable mm. and telling stories via film. It's not. It's a lot. It's a lot more expensive. <laughs> and it's different. <laughs> it's, it's different. Um, I mean, I loved it. I, I love movies. I love that mode of storytelling. Um, was It was still me running from writing, mm. if truth be told. Um, and then film school ended. And I, during senior year, like right before I shot my thesis, this sounds unconnected, but it is connected. About a month before we shot my thesis, um, one of my dear friends from high school um, died by suicide. Mm, and he sorry. he worked for, thank you, um, he worked for NASA and he was a literal rocket scientist. And yeah. it was one of those things where every time we all came home for holidays and stuff, people would want to talk to him about working for NASA, being a rocket scientist, being a, a physicist or, or whatnot. And um, it turned out that that was not the happy, fulfilling thing it seemed to be for him. And I'm sure, you know, there's always a, a litany of other factors going on in that kind of situation. But I think he felt a little, I don't want to um, oversimplify it, but I know that he felt a little bit uh, trapped in that. And um, I was starting to feel a sense of like, well, I need to, I got to stick with this because people expect me, like, this is the thing everybody wants to talk to me about when I come home. Like, what are you doing in film school? What kind of movies? Are you going to make movies when you graduate? And kind of coming to the realization that that actually wasn't filling me up the way that I hoped it would. And it didn't suit me the way I hoped it would. And so I decided not to make movies. And I started working at a camp after that, which was super great, teaching kids about the outdoors and science. And I was doing that in California and my family was in Kansas. And so I was like, you know what? I can actually do this in Kansas and live close to family. And then I moved here and then I accidentally went into ministry. Uh, and then I found writing again, which was like coming home. Well, why the why the jump over into ministry real quick? Yeah, you're just I, like... I know, I glossed right over that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe intentionally, but it's a podcast interview. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah it's, it, you know, that's a... I even like... D was hesitant about whether or not I wanted to mention that when I in the email because I don't talk about that on my social media platforms um, because it's it's such a loaded thing. Uh, sure. There are a lot of when you say I'm a pastor, there's a lot of baggage that comes with that, both for just the idea of what a pastor is and also for people's experience of um, either being entrenched in or helped by or very much mm -hmm. harmed by uh, religion. Absolutely. And but I did look at the church, and I was like, okay. She's oh, fine. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it provides, it's, uh, it definitely requires a little bit of context. So I was a part of a, a really neat community when I came back to Kansas City that um, was a new church that had formed out of kind of a, a awful split situation. And, um, you know, they were really social justice forward and very much about like inclusivity and lifting people up. And um, and I started doing some kids stuff for that community because I worked at a camp. I was like, I can do kids stuff. And so they were like, hey, we'll pay you to do some of the kids stuff. <laughs> and I was like, that's even better. And so I was doing that and I was like, well, I like to I like to tell stories. I like to write. I could I could do a sermon. And then um, they had me preach the Sunday after Christmas one year, you know, the day when nobody's there. And, and it just was a like, you know, it's storytelling in another way, making meaning of life and trying to find purpose. And so I kind of um, did that once and it was really fulfilling and uh, decided I was going to check out seminary to try to kind of like rule this out. And seminary ended up being super great. And this community is really great. And so I'm a pastor at this really neat little social, again, social justice mm -hmm. forward community mm -hmm. that is about love and inclusivity and lifting people up. So yeah. And yeah. So you're an that. active pastor. Like that's an active <laughs> wow. job you have. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Sure, and I, and I, I did, I, I heard you say, I don't lead with this. I kind of don't talk about it because, and I really appreciate this. So I want to highlight it that you recognize that there is harm and damage caused to many communities from religion and you 
what I'm hearing is you want to avoid causing more harm and damage. Um, and and I think what you shared with us is reminding us that you know don't make don't always make assumptions. Be open. Let's let's hear because not everyone is bad. Um, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I don't also, like, I, organized you know, religion people, is not for me either. But I do. It's a mess. <laughs> Let's be real. It's a big mess. Yeah. yeah. And I also like, I, you know, selfishly, when I say that, I see there's like a thing that happens in people's eyes where either there are assumptions about like what that means about what I would write. Like there's sex in my book. The word <gasps> fuck is in the first five pages. You know, <laughs> yes. it's, it's yes. like... Yes, sex. I oh love that. God. Gross. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's. I mean, all of that is is really. I just. I think it's really important to have sex. healthy representations oh, of, a, yeah, yeah. of sex and adult relationships and consent um, in literature. And so I'm. I'm really on board with it. But um, yeah, you know, people start wondering like, okay, have I said fuck? Have I? And I'm. I always. <laughs> I think it's an act of pastoral care. I try to say fuck first in a conversation just to get it out of the way. Everybody, you sermon, are welcome here. Sermon the day after Christmas. <laughs> welcome I don't everyone. Trust people How that was don't your say fuck. fucking <laughs> yeah. Christmas? You know. All it's right. like contextually, so, so, you know, try to so like funny. if somebody, so, if I feel like I'd make somebody uncomfortable, you know, I don't want to spew words all over like, the place yeah, drop a drop a fuck just to like break the ice a little bit just a little it sprinkle. does let people know where you stand like i'm, I'm a cool pastor yeah. i'm a cool pastor right? <laughs> I, I tell I, people they will like me and my book if they like lesbians curse words and exclamation points because i am a gen xer and we love exclamation points <laughs> they're great they're they're great exclamation point so uh i guess you've talked about failure a lot and uh, learned from it and used it but like ultimately if you were to sum up your relationship with failure what would that be god um i don't even know <laughs> i i guess i i don't even i don't know that i really think about things and you know i never thought about me not writing a book as a failure i just thought like Oh, I've gone in a different direction. It's only in hindsight that I've said hmm. I I failed at writing a book a lot of times because I'm definitely a, like I spin every situation for the pot. I am a disgustingly uh, interminable optimist. So I I definitely spin situations as they're happening to try to find like the good, to find silver lining, to find the thing that it's going to teach me. And it's only in hindsight that I've been like, yeah. I I tried that and I failed at it. Um, so I, I don't know. Enneagram seven, everything's happy. We're not going to hang out in the sad emotions. <laughs> that's, that's not really, that's a, sorry, that's a horrible answer, but um, it's, it's that's true. No, I think it's great. I actually love that you said you only really discover that it's been a quote unquote failure upon reflection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's really beautiful to me because by then it's a learning point, a learning opportunity yeah, and not something that holds you back. And I am dying to know your human design, of course, because she brought up the Enneagram and now I want to know. I don't know human design. All right. I'm just going to, I'm just going to take a little nap. Just Go ahead, Heather. Send me, no, no, no. It's okay. Send me no, a not, private message and we'll talk about it. Human design is um, a combination of several different ancient philosophies okay. and it helps you, um, it it shows you how to live into yourself authentically and fully. There's nothing okay. to change or fix. It is only your own natural dharmic strengths, problem solving, all of that. I'm certified in in human design. Tell and her, I'm obsessed with it. Tell but. her about your your session, uh, whatever you're allowed to say with uh, Javier when you met oh, in with person. Javi. Yeah, you, you, Javier Munoz. Do you know? I don't know if you follow Broadway enough to know who Javi is, but. He was Lynn Manuel Miranda's understudy for Hamilton, and then he took over the role after him. Yes. And, oh, we went to see Hamilton, and he was supposed to be performing, but it was his understudy on for the night. Oh, you which was Hattie. also That's great. Unfortunate. Was also wait, great. So you, wait, so sexy it, Hamilton. Yeah. So you saw. Um, okay, never mind. Go. Yes. So <laughs> we had Javi on a few months ago, and Human Design came up, and he was like, "I'm so fascinated by it," and he reached out and. The last time I was in New York, Ellen and I were doing some work together and seeing a lot of shows. I had the privilege of um, 
meeting Javier for a picnic in Central Park and doing a live human design reading for him, which we both, it was beautiful and there were tears and it was really gorgeous. So That sounds wonderful. Uh, let me know. Well, you want to talk about it? But the, the point of me bringing that up was that the, he something he said to you, and we'll cut this if we're not allowed to talk about it, um, but uh, that the human design helped him understand his behavior and better funnel it into success and creativity, right? Correct. Yeah. Cool. Right. So it allowed him That's to categorize his behavior and, and use it to his advantage. And to lean in more. So, for example, in your human design, we can find out what your best environment is, where you are the most creative and inventive. And his happens to be Shores. And he's like, oh, my God, when I'm stuck, I, I go to the shore. And I'm like, yeah, because that's because you don't even know that that's your thing. So now you can do it intentionally. Now you can cool. seek it out instead of have it be an afterthought. That's just one teeny tiny thing. Um, so yeah, that's magic. No, I'm, I'm curious. I have I have predictions, but you know. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm gonna have to look into this. <laughs> this is really cool. So Paula, can you tell us the trajectory of the Kickstarter and the stuff that you're doing, how people can get involved, how they can yeah. follow you? Because in fall of 2024, your book comes out and yes. there's going to be a lot of stuff happening between now and then. Oh, my God. So many things. Um, and of course, I'm going to document it all on TikTok because that's what I do now, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Kickstarter will, the there's like a, a pre-Kickstarter that'll start in January. There'll also be um, some cover reveals happening, The both the special edition cover and the standard edition cover um, happening in January as well. Um, and if you are interested, like, so you can always follow me on TikTok or Instagram, but I also have an email list, um, which is a really, uh, maybe the best way to make sure you get information if you want it. But Kickstarter will be going live in January and we'll probably finish in March. And then after that, um, the pre-order, the standard pre-order for the book will also be live on Amazon or, you know, wherever you buy books and it should be up on Goodreads by then and, There'll be lots of um, lots of fun shenanigans happening on the video yeah. apps between now and then. <laughs> That's awesome. I can't wait to follow that whole journey. And just for those who are listening, it was this came up on threads just yesterday. Somebody said, I don't understand the point of pre-orders. Back in the day, if you pre-ordered something from, say, you know, Barnes and Noble or even Amazon, it meant that it landed on your doorstep on release day. And it doesn't really mm -hmm. mean that anymore. But pre-orders help the author, y'all. They help the author, especially an indie self-published author. It helps people know that their book is good. It helps them make bestseller lists, all of that. So if you're going to get the book, go ahead and pre-order it. Paula, this has been so much fun. Thank you for spending some time with us today. Your journey is just fun to watch. I think this, you know, reminder for people that sometimes the risk is in just showing up and saying out loud the thing you're desiring causes creation. It's true. It's very true. You guys, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed meeting you. Thank you. You're so awesome. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. You guys are great. I'm so, I'm, and I'm so glad I now found your podcast through all this, too. Heck yeah. Me, too. <laughs> Listen and tell everybody about it, please. Leave yeah, a rating. Absolutely. Everybody absolutely. loves rating. I just got inaugurated into the quiet, fun, underground world of book publishing. Integrated? Inaugurated? What's the word I'm looking for? In initiated. Initiated. Uh, into initiated. The world. One of those other I words. Yes. <laughs> that's, initiated. That's nuts. I have my super gold leaf spray painted deluxe edition hologram. And I'm like, yes, people love that. If it's comic book related, I can equate. Yes. They do. So there are, I'm a library user. I get all of my books from the library and then I usually return them. Even though readers out there don't get mad at me, like I love books. And if I had a really big house and a room full of bookshelves, I would keep a copy of everything I've ever read. But when you read, you know, nine to 12 books a month, you just can't do that. Um, except the books that I love, I will go back and get a hard copy of. And then the authors, there are about three authors that I follow intensely. And anything they put out, I'm getting whatever their special edition is and they live beautifully on my shelf. Not bad. Well, hopefully Paula will give you a special edition of her I'm, book. I'm going to get uh, my own Kickstarter dude. book. 
That was super yeah. cool. Like going from one thing to another, uh, film to ministry to authoring. Um, I I love it at the end. She was saying, yeah, yeah. Like looking back, you can classify things as failure, but I I would argue even too that it's that it's not even failure. Like she said, it's learning experiences because she still mm-hmm. completed it. That's not like she Absolutely. ever gave up. It's not like she ever stopped trying. She just kept pivoting because the that method whatever she was on at that time that path didn't work so i don't i would argue she hasn't failed at all absolutely well i would argue that no one does right like fail fast fail first fail hard drew stern said that here on this very show like the whole goal is to just get that first one out of the way Mm -hmm. and then you're going to learn from it and grow and do something different and hopefully better and if you look at it that way there is no failure yeah i agree there you go there you go peeps So I just think this was really fun because it shows you in this world that we live in, this fast-paced world where there are so many reasons to dislike social media. And there are, um, you can also, it has changed the game. Like YouTube has changed whether or not you can be discovered and the friendships that you make on TikTok and going viral, like all of that stuff literally changes the trajectory of an artist's life. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. People get cast in shows and, you know, TV, film, Broadway, whatever, sometimes based on on uh, all things equal talent wise um, on social media clout. And that's not something that, you know, the, I guess the uh, the cool factor of that is not being debated here, but it is the nature of our current reality. Yeah. Yeah, but even if you don't have the clout, if you have the talent and the right people see it, yeah. there's a lot of discovery there. Yeah. So anyway, it was a lot of fun and she's fun and she put up with us and uh, we love to hear from you. We love to know what episodes are really resonating with you, what's lighting you up. We love those five-star reviews and... Um, Please keep giving those, share the episodes with other people. But also we want to hear, you know, how are you out taking intentional risk and doing all this fun stuff? How can folks connect with us, Alan? At was it chance podcast at gmail.com. And was it chance on Instagram threads? Are we on TikTok? We're on TikTok. No? We are not on TikTok, you but you can find me. Yeah, find Heather. I'm Brave Heather on TikTok and Alan is Alan Seals on TikTok. No, I'm theater podcast the theater podcast i haven't gone personal you, on tiktok you are the theater podcast but it just has your name if they search your name they're gonna find you oh yeah okay I should. when i type your name it comes up sweet okay there you go um but yeah we are on threads as well and we love to hear from you we do follow us in all the places oh youtube y'all please go to youtube and subscribe even if you don't watch or listen there <laughs> We really, we're really working hard to get those YouTube subscriptions up. So just do this that solid. That that would be great. No, seriously, we love you guys. You have been listening to Was It Chance, the podcast about embracing opportunity and taking intentional risk for your creative life. I'm Heather Vickery. And I'm Alan Seals. Bet you had to read that. I totally had to read that. I totally <laughs> did. I was like, oh, scroll up on the page. Let's read that. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye, you guys. Talk to you later.